What an exciting day that we have before us. Amen? Amen. Man, it's so good to have all of you here with us today. Uh, Our friends, family, guests, neighbors, enemies, whoever you may be. We are glad that you are here with us today, I can assure you. So if you're a friend or a neighbor, see me after the service. If you're an enemy, make sure that you see Wade or Matthew. I'll take it. (laughs) Look, there are a couple things that are happening today that we just want you to kind of see. And it's why we're interacting the way that we are. The One Association is an association of churches that have united around the idea that the Holy Spirit is moving on the earth today and that we should be unashamed of that. That there is a harvest to be had in every nation and that that should move our hearts in every way. And thirdly, that the orthodoxy of the scripture is everything. That if the scripture says it, that settles it. Well, there are members of those churches here today, leaders from those churches here today. As an association of churches, we are recognizing an ordination. The ordination is coming from actually this body and these pastors because they have discipled and lived next to Buddy Brasso all of these years and are affirming along with the association of what is happening in his life. What this means for us is that a church is not isolated to itself. You are ordained when your peers recognize that you are in fact a peer. And ordination is not just local to the church, it is the churches. And that is what is happening here today. Amen. If you all turn with me to Numbers chapter 8, we're going to get into the word. When you find the scripture, Numbers chapter 8, say there when you are there. We want to make sure that you not only can find the place in your actual Bible, your actual uh, device that you have before you, the word of God itself, but we want to make sure that you're there in mind and spirit as well. Amen. Amen. Numbers chapter eight and verse 10. Today we get to look at the idea of the ordination. We're going to ordain Buddy Brasso this morning. What a great day. In Numbers chapter eight, we see what the word of God has to say. This is not merely just a ceremony. This is not merely a perfunctory obligation. Come on. Look at Pastor getting the nomenclature down. Perfunctory. That's a big word. This is not just something that we are doing to fill, fulfill an obligation. This is something that we have found in the Word of God, its ancient origins that were given from the heavens to a certain group of people to the Jews, to the Hebrew people that he was speaking to, that we have now become a part of their inheritance. Not a replacement, but a part of. And so what we do is we look back to the foundational pieces to say if this was the way that God said that mankind should do it, that's exactly how we want to do it. Amen? Amen. And Numbers chapter 8 and verse 10, look what it says. It says, you are to bring the Levites before the Lord, and the Israelites are to lay their hands on them. We're going to have Buddy and his family come forward in just a little while. We're going to lay hands on Buddy Brasso. We're going to believe the Lord for prophecies right here in your midst, right in front of you. Words directly from the heaven for this beautiful family. The word says that they are to lay their hands on. Who is supposed to lay their hands on? What does the word say there on your screen? The Israelites. This is a community event. This is not something that is hidden off in a room somewhere that was decided from a uh, some papal office or anything else that we can find. This was designed to be in front of the community. Why? Because there was supposed to be a connection between the Levites or the priests, God's people, and the entirety group. This is a confirmation, as Pastor Eric has said. It's a recognition. One of the parts that I love best about an ordination is, uh, yeah, none of us can claim this. None of us can cause this to happen. It is Jesus Christ himself that sets members of the fivefold in place. He does that. He designates that. He calls that because I can assure you there's not one man standing before you that would have been chosen by any other human being, I promise. And they would have probably been right to do so. But our great king chooses the men that he wants to serve him. Notice that it is not from an academic pursuit. But he is an excellent student. But it's not because he made perfect scores in a classroom somewhere or wrote clever essays that rocked theological professors to sleep. It is because he is functioning in the community 
as a pastor Amen. and the community recognizes yeah. that. Amen. Let's go on in the word here in verse 11. It says that Aaron is to present the Levites before the Lord as a wave offering from the Israelites so that they may be ready to do the work of the Lord. The, f- the first part of this verse said Aaron is to present them before the Lord. Buddy, in just a few minutes, we're going to actually present you before the Lord within this community. You are a gift to us in every way, yeah. and you're also an offering unto the Lord that we're going to wave before the Lord and say, Lord, what a fine offering that you've made out of this family. Amen. That you've taken them from places that no one else would have given them credit, and you molded them into something that is of a divine nature. Yeah. And so we are recognizing this before the Lord. But why do we do that? Just, just to feel good about ourselves? No. Apparently the word of God says, so that they may be ready to do the work. Come on, say do the work. Do the work. If you know this church, you know we're about, in fact, doing the work. Amen. Buddy and Kim and Julia have an incredible task that's before them. We're going to charge them this morning to reach, to evangelize, to minister to the nation of Peru. Yeah. They're gonna, they have a, a home base of operations, but our expectation is that when they one day transition into the Lord's presence, that the entirety of the nation is going to be impacted by this family. Yes. We're going to start in Chivai. We're going to start in Coca Canyon. But the work of the Lord that this family is going to do is going to far outlast them. It's going to take generations. It's going to take many more people to accomplish this because, uh, yeah, they're getting ready to do the work. Amen. Amen. Let's take a look also now. Let's skip down to verse 18. Verse 18. Are you there with me? Y'all not asleep yet, are you? Okay, just checking. Verse 18, it says, And I have taken the Levites in place of all of the firstborn sons in Israel. Hold up just a second. Do we have any firstborns in the house today? Yeah? (laughs) Hey, we're family, right? As a matter of fact, that is a perfect segue for what we're talking about in this. Good thing we're not reading Exodus 12, because that could be bad for those of you that just raised your hand. (laughs) In Exodus 12, it was all the firstborn that died. The Lord actually uses that homiletic. He uses that lesson in their life and says, yeah, by the way, all the firstborn belong to me as the Lord. And therefore, the firstborn were obligated to serve the Lord. If this would have been from that time period, it was the firstborn that should have come in and been those serving in the very house of the Lord. But what he did was something incredible. He called out a group of people, the Levites, because they would stand with the sword in their hand, regardless of the people that were before him, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers. They held to the standard of God's word, even over familial ties. Yeah. But because the Lord was trying to cause the Levites to be like family for us. Yeah. Boy, that's easy to think about when you think about the Brassos. Aren't they already family? Yeah. Yeah. Man, if you just think about them, we, we're crazy enough. We love them enough. We're like, yeah, buddy, on your ordination weekend, we want you to cook food for us. <laughs> Woo! Who does that? Yeah, we do. <laughs> and we were all blessed because of it, right? Yeah. So if you were going to take the Levites in place of the firstborn, if you're a firstborn like me, What would you think about the Levites? Wouldn't you have a connection to the priest, to God's priesthood by going, wow, that should be my job. That could be my job. But there are people serving in my stead. You know what that would make me consider them? Just like family. Amen. That is the heart of ordaining in the fivefold ministers. We stand before you today not as trained professionals, but rather as family members. You see that. You guys are irreverent. No, we're not. We're family. Amen. The reason that we can pick on Spencer because of his T-Rex arms is because... <laughs> Praise him, Lord. Praise God. <laughs> Praise him. It's because we're family. When Buddy came to this church, he was excited. We went on mission trips together, and he said, this is like Navy SEALs. So many years later, it's more like Navy walruses. (laughs) Look, think through this with me. How many of you have heard the term, blood is thicker than water? Yeah, that's every hand in the room. 
That term was originally the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. See, the ties that happen between you and the Levite, they are stronger than the ties of simply being born to the same mother. And there's a reason for that. One brought you into this world, and the other helps you obtain the next. So Buddy is our family, and we're blessed here to have his natural family here as well. When your natural family looks at you and says, it's like that spiritual family, it's like I, I'm jealous how much you love them. You can always look and say, great, come be a part. You can be part of both. Amen. 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 Verse 18 again, and I have taken the Levites in place of all the firstborn sons in Israel. What a beautiful piece of this. Let's look at verse 19. Of all the Israelites, I have given the Levites as gifts to Aaron. Man, if we had time this morning, we could stop all and camp on this idea that Levites, that the priesthood are gifts. Buddy Brasso, your family is an incredible gift to this body. Amen. You are a gift before the Lord. You are a gift to us. You are a gift to everyone in this room. And we're going to get to celebrate that with you. And we are honored to do this. I, I, if you've known Buddy at all, if you know him even in the slightest bit, if you know Kim at all, you understand that this family is a gift. They are a treasure, aren't they? Yes. yes. Let's turn to Leviticus chapter 8. We were in Numbers 8. Let's turn to Leviticus 8. There. 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 Brothers fast. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> he knew where we were going. But if you'll come on up forward and, and stand right here with us. In Leviticus chapter 8, come on, make your way up here. Stand beside us. Since he spent a few months in Peru, he fits up here easier. <laughs> <laughs> we needed him to lose the weight so he could fit between us now. <laughs> verse 22 says this. Leviticus chapter 8 and verse 22 says he then presented the other ram. Everybody say other ram. other ram. The ram for ordination. Wow. What a beautiful picture we have here. Not just a lamb, but the king of the lamb. The king of the sheep. The ram itself. As you think through that, you can trace it all the way through the Bible and understand and get a bigger picture. It's not just a ram for this ordination that's going to be offered. You can think back to Genesis 22 and be reminded that as Abraham is offering his son Isaac, it is in fact a ram that's been caught in the thicket by his horns. Amen. It is, you can think through the entirety of the Old Testament and remember the Azazel, those things that can take away our sin, all the way into the New Testament that says, when John looked and said, behold, it's the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. And this is what we're offering here as it said this. The ram for ordination and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on its head. Moses slaughtered the ram. There's a great sacrifice for what we're going to do today. There was a great sacrifice by our king of kings who was slaughtered so that we can do things like this today. We think about his sacrifice as being a salvation, and that in fact is exactly what it is. And it is also necessary for the ordination. And look what it does in verse 23. Moses slaughtered the ram and took some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear, on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. What an interesting thing to do. Taking blood, we're going we're gonna to dab it on your right ear, on your right thumb, and on your right big toe. As we get ready with Buddy, our equal in every way, Yes. truth is, is He's better looking, he's smarter, he's more anointed, so we're, but in every way he is our equal. We're going to talk today, and we're going to do this right now, we're going to pray over him. Yeah. Amen. We're going to pray and ask that the blood of Jesus Christ be on his right ear. Yeah. That he will always hear rightly from the very heavens. That everything that he hears will be filtered through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It will be anointed in every way that as he goes forth, that as he is listening to the hearts of those in Peru. Anybody ever been guilty of saying one thing and really meaning something else? Yeah. Okay. All right. 
Yeah, we're not that church where you just sit there and look at us. No, you're going to have to answer. Anybody, anybody ever done that before? Yes. Our prayers for Buddy this morning are going to be that he always hears through that. They can always hear beyond what someone is saying and get to the heart of the matter because his blood's in fact, his ears in fact have been touched by the blood from the heavens. Amen. Come on, y'all stretch, your for, stretch forth your hands right now. Mighty God, as your representatives, we bring Buddy before the community of believers in this place. Lord, I anoint Buddy's right ear in this moment. God, that your blood and that your very anointing oil will be upon this man and upon his ears. God, may he hear from the heavens. May you open up revelation. May you open up understanding and knowledge, wisdom, and the fear of the Lord. May these be his. Lord, may his hearing be filtered. Every single word that comes in, filtered through your blood, anointed by your anointing oil, mighty God, that he may hear from the heavens, that he may hear through deception, that he may hear through the weakness, that he may hear through the hurting that people have and rightly comprehend exactly what he is supposed to do, Lord. Amen. May he always follow your words. May he always hear directly from the heavens, Lord, in each and everything that he does. Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So next we have the thumb on the right hand. One thing that has marked Buddy Brasso's life and his entire family has been their acts of service that what he heard with his ears was then carried out and performed by his hands. Not only could he cook a mean jambalaya, he could lead a cleaning crew like nobody's business, but everywhere that Buddy went, he was eager to serve, ready. And he demonstrated his love for the Lord with acts of righteousness. Let's go to Psalm 144. We'll read verse 1. Psalm 144, verse 1, say, there when you're there. There we go. It says, praise be to the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Buddy has spent, and he and his family has spent time with us getting his hands trained for war, getting his fingers trained for battle. Why, saints? Because we are in a war, and we are in a battle. This is real. People's lives are at stake. And I am proud to say that Buddy and his family have been trained for war and trained for battle. Stretch your hands forward again. Let's pray over his hands. Mighty God, with your strength in Buddy's right hand, on his right thumb, Lord, I pray that your works, your righteous deeds are performed through these hands that they will lead his family into the promises of God. They will lead his family up and down the mountains of Peru, seeking souls that are lost, seeking souls that are broken, that need your presence, that need your oil of joy poured upon them. Lord, I pray that as he demonstrates your kingdom through these actions in his hands, that your name be glorified, that the name of Jesus be lifted high upon his hands, that revelation is given to those that have received from these hands whether with acts of service or, Lord, as he demonstrates your word in preaching and teaching and ministering. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for the works that will come from these hands. Amen. The priest received an anointing in three places. The lobe of his right ear, the thumb on his right hand, and the great toe on his right foot. Now, there's a reason that it was always on the right side. The right side is the strong side. The right side is the strength of a man. The strength of Buddy will be that he hears from God. That his hands are used in God's service. But the last thing to be anointed was his foot. The great toe on his right foot. I want to read you something the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 10. It's Romans 10, beginning in verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach 
unless they are sent. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those that bring good news. I want you to understand that in its essence, the gospel starts with your feet. It starts with your feet because it's a man with beautiful feet. Feet that were anointed by God who is sent. And when he is sent, he preaches. And when he preaches, they hear. And when they hear, they believe. And when they believe, they call on the name of the Lord. And when they call on the name of the Lord, they get saved. We're going to pray for the strength of Buddy's travels today. He's not chasing money. He's not chasing women. He's not chasing the riches of this world. He is chasing after souls for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. We're going to pray for the strength of his right foot. That as he goes through the mountains in Peru and the valleys in Peru, that he makes level paths for the Lord in people's lives. Can you say amen to that? Let's pray for Buddy's feet. Mighty God, you have said how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those that bring good news. Lord, we say these feet are beautiful. They're beautiful because they have been prepared with the gospel of peace. Lord, may these feet carry him into your will every day of his life. May they run after the wandering sheep and the lost sheep. Lord, may they stand their ground firmly against the enemy. Lord, make his feet secure and quick to do what is right. We thank you for this anointed man of God. From the top of his head to the bottoms of his feet, he is your workmanship. Christ is formed in him. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We wanted to do something here. And present Buddy with a ordination certificate. This way, anywhere he goes in the world, he has an endorsement, not from us, from you, and from the congregations of the other One Association churches that says, we recognize the high call of God on his life. To that end, we'd like to invite our guest pastors and elders here to give a charge as they see fit by the Spirit to Buddy Brasso. Please make your way to the front. <clears throat> this is some awesome times we're in. We've had the privilege of doing life with these, this family and excited to be a part of where they're headed. You know, uh, <laughs> I hear often, I wonder what God is going to do. What, what, am, what am I going to be doing when I come to the full calling of, uh, I, I start a ministry that God called me into. But <clears throat> that's not the question. The question should be, what are you doing with the one talent that you have today? Amen. But these guys, these guys have truly been doing that. And you know, there's no question about what they're going to be doing in Peru because they're only going to be continuing what they've done and practice here. So we're excited, excited about that. You know, <clears throat> the scripture was read in the service today. Nick read that. It started out with, when the boat landed, they recognized Jesus. And when the boat lands in Peru... They recognize Jesus. Amen. 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 So, you know, as a family, and I'm sure the, I know the pastors can relate to this. When we send out a loved one yeah. to be joined in covenant with another, we don't lose a family member. No. We gain a whole new, yes. complete family. Yes. Amen. Yes. And I can't wait to meet the rest of my family in Peru. Yes. As you're doing God. God. Amen. 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 Love you, brother. Love you too, man. Can't wait for you to come there and meet him. Thank you, Charlie. Buddy. Yes, sir. I want to echo the uh, sentiments that the pastors and everybody that knows you have yeah. about your hard work. 
we have uh, we have seen how you have proven yourself for the kingdom, yeah. not by not by any kind of divinity practices or anything like that, but Amen. actually doing the work. And uh, some guys are the most interesting people in the world. You are the most hardworking man I know. Thank yeah. you, brother. And we really appreciate that. And it's so evident in your life and the lives of your family. Yeah. I wanted to read you a scripture here. Um, just as the Lord was concerned with his people, Israelites, he was concerned with the people of Nineveh. He also is concerned with the people of Peru. Yeah. And so in Exodus 33, starting in 13, if you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Amen. So you will have a people that you are responsible to in the eyes of the Lord, because he is genuinely concerned about this salvation. And uh, we have full confidence that you will take this call, and you will multiply 30, 60, 100 Yes. We can see it already happening, Amen. and I think it's just yeah. going to continue in Peru, and we're really excited about that. Amen. Love you, man. Yeah, I love you too, man. Yeah. Love you much, brother. Brother Buddy, <laughs> it's awesome. Ever since I've known you, you have been single-focused. Your mission is to further the kingdom of heaven, Amen. and it's Amen. awesome. And uh, no soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, Amen. and you are single-focused, and uh, you're an amazing ambassador, and you're going to be an amazing ambassador. If you listen to what the voice of the Lord is telling you as you go into Peru, you will be claiming territory that the enemy has stolen. And I'm proud to be a warrior next to you, brother. Amen, brother. Amen. I'm glad to have you, my man. Hey, buddy. I love you, brother. Not like I love you, Amen. Brother. Yeah, on the behalf of all of us at Submission Ministry, Zeke told me to tell you that we confirm and, uh, what the Lord is doing in you and Julia and Kim Praise is beautiful. Lord. And you're anointed for this task. So this scripture I'm going to read is just going to re-edify that a little okay. bit. Amen. Um, it's in Psalms 27, uh, verse 6. It says, Now my head will be lifted up above my enemies, lifted above, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. Um, and in the verse before that, uh, we see that the, that the Lord establishes that upon a rock. And upon that rock, he then puts his people above his enemies. Uh, so what I see is you and Julie and Kim being established there with a firm foundation. And he's going to set you up to be above the enemies and above the reproach of anybody that comes against you guys. So you hold fast to that and know that all your brothers and sisters are behind you, warring for you, and right here for you. So, and your steadfastness that I see to get it right. Your obedience to, to do things the right way. It's going to go well with you, Yatab. It will go well with you because of your vision for the Lord. So I love you, brother. I love you. Amen, Amen brother. Amen. <laughs> uh, my fondest memory is uh, Buddy picking me up for a men's retreat in Louisiana and uh, sharing a little testimonies on the way. And uh, then watching him getting saved and filled with the Holy Ghost around yeah. a bonfire one night. Yeah. It has never been the same. It's Praise crazy. Lord, uh, Elder Mark uh, alluded to you being a warrior, mm -hmm. and there's no doubt about it. It's one thing to anoint and ordain you Texans, but when you ordain some Cajuns, you got to watch out. Yeah. <laughs> we can send you anywhere in the world than it's up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a good word, matter of fact. Yeah. <laughs> confirm that right now. Speaking of, as I was praying about um, some of the things that we share, um, uh, we really share um, an underdog mentality, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, you come from and, uh, you know, we're not where we were and, not, you know, we're not where we're going to be. Amen. So in uh, Gideon 6, uh, the Lord reminded me and, and showed me a few things, and I'm going to read that to you. Um, I'm going to shorten it. In uh, chapter 6, in verse 1, it says, Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hand of the Midianites. Uh, and then he goes on to say, uh, whenever the Israelites planted their crops, uh, the Midianites would come against them. Um, it would say things like that they invaded them and they ravaged it. Then in verse 7 it says, When the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, 
he sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of, salvation, uh, of slavery. Uh, I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of the oppressors. Mm -hmm. I drove them from you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship uh, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. Um, then he goes on to say, um, uh, speak to Gideon and uh, calls out Gideon uh, to do a work in this land that had been oppressed, ravaged, and invaded. Uh, and he called him uh, a mighty warrior. He goes on to say, uh, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of the Midianites' hands, for I am sending you. And as I was praying and contemplating this, I really saw uh, just that Gideonite spirit, right? That underdog mentality mm -hmm. that's been uh, just driven into your DNA because you're going to need it. You know, you're going into a land uh, that's been ravaged and, uh, and invaded, but God's called you for this. And he's equipped your family for these things. And so I wrote down these points. In an oppressed land, whenever you've, been planted, when you've planted your crops, the enemy will try to invade and ravage it. Uh, but remember where you came from. Yes. You're a Gideonite, an underdog, weak in man's eyes, but mighty in God's and in your brother's. Amen. And that yes. story will be continued through you. When you look back, put this one on your shelf. Yeah. The Lord's going to give you fruit in the land of Peru, and we're going to rejoice that the kingdom of heaven is at hand in Peru. Amen. 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 I love you, my brother. I love you too, man. Thank you so much, brother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, brother. This is incredible. I got a word for the guy. Uh, where's the guy with the short arms? Spencer McLean. Brother, you ain't got nothing on these short arms, man. I got you beat, brother. I'm the one with the shortest arms in this church. Where you at, Chris Mazzara? <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> I'm standing here and on so I'm just blown away on so many levels. I'm looking at these three men up here. Yeah. I, look, I saw the day I was born again. I saw those same three men that that Sunday. I, 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 that same week, I saw all three of you, Amen. and uh, it's incredible to see what God is doing and the connections, yeah. brother, that you are um, just a part of with them and yeah. how, how the Lord has brought all this to full circle. How long have I known you now? Eight months. That's all it takes. That's all it's taken. That's all it's taken for me to know a part of what you're about. This is a very special um, thing. You know, when a, when a church sets something apart like this, this is not just a formality. This is in the hearts of these men up here and then in the hearts of this church. Uh, this day has been set apart. Hagiazo holy Amen. it's set apart god is in the holy of holies yes. yeah. brother when this is set apart on your behalf god's not joining us we're joining him yeah. that's where he dwells in the holy places and, and you've made this a holy moment time stands still right now yeah. and uh we we, we kind of spoke about this last night uh i was talking with you last night and i got this word earlier in the week and i thought it was for me this for you. And uh, we talked about it last night, but Jesus told the disciples to cast that net on a particular side of the boat in John 21. And if you read clearly, you look between the lines, you can tell that they had already done that. They already threw it, not only there, but everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how many men of God with, with pure hearts have just cast nets Every good idea they could think of, every planning meeting they could think of, every trend that's worked for others and uh, cast a net here, cast a net there, didn't work, didn't work, what are we doing wrong? And um, the key was not only where to cast it, but when to cast it. And they casted it when he said to cast it, even though they had already casted it before. Before that eight months, I don't know where you casted your nets. I don't know if maybe you cast at some and they came back empty. Yeah. Maybe they didn't even come back. <laughs> As a fisherman, I know that happens sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and, um, 
But I know this much. I know you heard the Lord. Amen. He told you where to cast a net, Peru. And he's telling you when to cast a net. Amen. And brother, that is set apart as unto him. Brother, you're not just going to Peru. You're going at the right time Amen. and at the right direction. Amen. And in your heart, it's not just a job or a duty. But it, brother, it's been set apart in your heart. Amen. It hadn't even taken me eight months to figure that out. So I just speak that word over you. I love you. I'm honored to stand beside you. I'm honored to stand in this church. My wife is over here, Heather. And, and we're, we're from Lafayette. And we're just blessed to be here with you guys. This is a, this is a fired up church. Don't, don't, don't let it get numb. This is a good yeah. thing. Amen. And brother, you're a big part of what this is all about. I love you. Thank you. Love and I'm looking forward to the next eight months. Amen. It's been a good eight months. Yeah, yes. Bless you, brother. Love you, man. At this time, we want to invite our elders and guest pastors to have a seat for a second. And Kim and Julia, you come here, join Buddy. Now listen carefully to this instruction, Elsia. Popcorn encouragement. If you're a man or a woman that has been born of God and you have a Popcorn encouragement for them. We'd like to hear it quickly. Brassos, we love you. We uh, had the opportunity to just spend some time praying and thinking back through some of the times that we spent together. And this morning, all of us were reflecting on missions trips, difficult events that we've spent, and that kind of bond that God has caused. Specifically, there was one passage that came to mind this morning. In Judges 3, we hear about Othiniel, a man who had survived a time in the desert and had been raised in a house with convictions that conquered giants, that laid down the land. Both Mike and I thought about the judges when we thought about you. Because in Judges, in the third chapter, it says Othiniel heard the cry of a people and something rose up inside of him and he delivered them. I have never called you and not gotten a response. I've never called you and needed help and you weren't there. That's right. LCM, have any of you called Buddy at any point in time and he did not come to your aid? No. See, that's not true for anyone in here. When we think about the Brassos, we think about people who have been raised in a house with deep convictions and they answer that call of God. The one thing that would be my prayer for you over these next few months is that God will continue to deepen those convictions so that you always have what you need to answer the next call. This world needs shofatim. It doesn't need any more pretty pastors. It needs diligent families who are willing to dig in, willing to answer that call in a bloody, difficult world, but salvation comes out of it. We are proud of you. Mr. Richard, would you come to the front of the line? The Bible says the last will be first. We wouldn't have a chance to praise Buddy had you not done your job first. Thank you, Pastor Eric. I know this is a very momental moment for us, and uh, I kind of put it on paper so I could give you something to think about. This is to dedicate to your ministry, Buddy. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you because he has anointed you to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent you to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus is made unto you wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. If you lack wisdom, you ask of God who gives to all men liberally and without reproach, and it is given to you, you walk in love. The love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. You have made in the righteousness of God in Christ. Whatever you do shall prosper, for you prosper and live in health even as your soul prospers. You tread on serpents and scorpions, 
and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall be by any means hurt you, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Yeah. I love you, buddy. I love you too, brother. Brass says, I love all three of you tremendously. Uh, I remember uh, a little bit over three years ago uh, when you guys showed up at the Stevens house at the time, and uh, we had an amazing night of worship and prophecy and just restoration and growth, and the Lord was speaking mightily to you guys that this is the place that you needed to be. And over the last three years, I've watched a family that was already strong in the Lord get exponentially stronger in three years' time. Uh, I've watched uh, a family uh, who loves the Lord uh, stretch out, learn new languages, uh, do all kinds of amazing things that not many people uh, get the privilege of, of stretching out and doing. You guys are a family of persevering saints. You guys are a family who looks and sets your eyes on a goal and achieve it no matter what gets in your way. And you're gonna to continue to do that and continue to get better and better at that as you move into this calling in Peru. When I was praying for you and looking through the word, I stumbled over Philippians chapter one. It says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. When I think about the Brasso family, I think about a family that constantly conducts themselves many, uh, in a manner worthy of Christ. And you've proven yourself over and over again. You, your family is uh, a family of servitude. And that, that's what Philippians chapter 2 is all about. The next chapter is Christ and servitude of his church. You guys uh, are the epitome of a family of servitude. Then whenever I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. Uh, as you've grown, there has been a fair share of opposition. <laughs> fair share of familial opposition, a fair share of non-familial opposition in your guys' lives. But the strength, the courage, the zeal, the perseverance has been a testimony to everyone who's been close to you and everyone far, far away from you that you are standing with God and they need to do something about their lives. And it's been powerful. You've seen lives change because of it. You've seen for others the chasm grow, but you're standing where God called you to stand. And that is what you're called to do. And that's what you do beautifully. It has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. You're granted belief, but you're also granted the high calling to suffer for his name. <laughs> it's a blessing to do and to go and do what you're, you guys are doing. I just want to thank you guys for being such an amazing example to this flock. And I want to thank you guys in advance for the example that you're setting as you go out and as you're launched and as you're ordained and as you uh, function as Christ in a completely new nation with a completely new faces. I want to thank you in advance for the trail that you're blazing for families like my own and families like the ones sitting in here because we look up to you. We value you tremendously. We love you, Brassos. Man, what a good word. I'm very excited to see 30 people stand. If you have not re yet reached your 18th birthday, Buddy's going to be in town till March 13th. Have a seat and give him a word after the service. The rest of you who are in line, this is important. It's the word of God. Do it in popcorn fashion. Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. 
Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is your strength, Brasso's. He makes your feet like the feet of a deer, and he enables you to go on the heights. You guys work regardless of results, and that is admirable. You work, you work, though the fig tree does not bud. You still praise him. You don't praise him because of what you see. You don't wait for the fulfillment. You work. You serve him because it is a joy to, to you. And he will enable your feet to climb those mountains. He will. Whatever fears, he will enable your feet like the feet of a deer. We love you guys so much. Thank you for your example. Amen. How many of you have seen popcorn? How many of you know what popcorn is? Is popcorn a slow burn? For instance, can you popcorn faster than you can cook a steak, say? So, Gabriel, stand up. Stand up. Sit down. Stand up. Sit down. That's what popcorn looks like. If, if we could set a timer and forget we set the timer, and then be surprised when the timer goes off. That is not popcorn. All right. It's my cue to make it quick. Yeah. So guys, uh, from me and my wife, we are very proud of you guys uh, as a brother. Uh, it's an honor to see an older brother uh, go through this. Reminds me of Joshua 4.14. says, in that day God exalted Joshua in the eyes of the Israelites. In this day you are exalted. Uh, I promised Mike I didn't steal your notes. But the word I got for you as I was praying this morning is on Judges 6. It says, Midian was so impoverished that the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. See, there has been a flood ravaging that land. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet. We've gone to that land. We have heard them say things like, we have been crying out that God would send somebody to this parched land. And God is sending you guys to that parched land. Amen. Listen what, what uh, he calls Gideon. The angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon. He said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Yes. And he says, go in the strength that you have. You don't have to wait any longer for more strength. Go with the strength that you have. That's the way of life that you've, you've been modeling and the way of life that you've taken upon yourself, the discipleship that you've undergone. Later on, Gideon asked the Lord, he said, how can you prove this to me? He goes and makes a sacrifice. After he makes that sacrifice, the angel, the angel shows himself to Gideon, and Gideon says, I have seen the Lord face to face. And then he goes out and makes an altar. That altar is called the altar of shalom. Mm. See, after you make sacrifice after sacrifice, God is going to show himself through that sacrifice that you give him. He's going to continually show yourself when you're asking the Lord, what do I do next? After you make a sacrifice, he's going to show himself to you, and then you will make an altar of right order and man in that land. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. Popcorn. Popcorn fashion. <laughs> He's going to hold the mic. Okay. All right. Scripture. <laughs> do you know what the Hebrew word for expedite is? I don't either, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> All right. Brasso family, Exodus 34. Just as uh, the Lord did for Moses and God's people, I think he's going to do the same for you. Verse 10, the Lord said, I am making a covenant with you before all your people. I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. The people who live among you will see how awesome, uh, see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. Obey what I command today. I will drive out before you the Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land. Where you're going. No treaties. That's right. No backup, let up, yep. or shut up. Amen. He's going to drive it all out. That's right. Amen. That's good. Amen. Amen. And I'm imitating popcorn, so I'll share with you later. <laughs> so I'll make it quick. I only have two scriptures for you guys. The first one is Psalm 73, starting at 25. It says, whom have I in heaven but you, and earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. 
The second one is Psalm 127, 1. It says, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. And you guys are anointed for the task. That right ear, that right thumb, the right foot, you are anointed for the task. And there will be resistance. But hold on to those scriptures that the Lord will deliver those people as he's delivered you. Amen. Amen. Hey, brother, I love you so much, you and your family. Um, the scripture I have is 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And it says, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, and know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. I was looking at your website at all the different terrains of Peru, and God has put his word as a seed in you to plant in the hearts of the men of Peru and the women. And seed grows in different terrains at different times. So your harvest will come, but do not give up, do not stop. Be steadfast, be immovable. We love you, and you're an excellent example of a brother. I love you so much. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, just to add, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, just to add what my husband was saying, you guys have been there for us, um, me and my family. Whenever we call you guys, you were there, and you've been set uh, as a great example to us, to our marriage, to my kids, how to raise their uh, children. Um, kind of emotional, but um, in Isaiah 5, um, verse 26, it said, He lift up a banner for the distant nations. He whistles for those at the end of the earth. Here they come swiftly and speedily. Not one of them grows tired or stumbles. Not one slumber or sleeps. Not a belt is loosened at the waist, not a stand or strap is broken. You stood for us, um, Kim and Buddy, uh, Jury, for our marriage. <laughs> and the sandal was not broken, and it will never broken. And when you, where you're going, you're going to do the same. You make sure that the sandal is not broken. Amen. Amen. You're aware that... Uh, this is not goodbye. They're not getting on a plane after the service. <laughs> that we're in January and they will be headed out in March. Okay, come on now. Good Lord, the popcorn's getting bigger. Good, I'll keep uh, what? <laughs> I'll keep it real sweet and simple. But uh, look, buddy, I remember the day I met you. I was sitting in my recliner with a wife beater on as we do in South Louisiana. <laughs> You knocked on my door, and uh, my whole life changed. Uh, I want to tell you, though, um, we're all family here. And if not anyone sees Buddy as a friend, you need to, because a friend does love at all times. But a brother is born for adversity. The task that is at hand, brother, you were born for it. And I am encouraged, and I am challenged uh, by it, and it's incredible, my friend. I love you, and I, and I want the best for you. Amen. Amen. Popcorn. Come on. I'm going to get straight to it because I'm going to love on y'all for the rest of the time y'all here, so we'll get to it. Teach me how to make that jumble life. Uh, so, out of 2 Corinthians uh, verse 4, uh, the Lord is anointing you to bring life to Peru, to those dry, parched lands. And I know that because you've brought life to me. You've brought life to everyone in this congregation that you've been around. Uh, and some things to, to take hold of. He says, you have this, this treasure in jars of clay, and God has given you that treasure. And although you're perplexed in despair, uh, persecuted but not abandoned, you, you, you face all these struggles you see in 2 Corinthians 4. This is what you have, and this is what you're bringing to the people in Peru. He says, you're always being given over to, the death for, death, to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in your mortal body. So then, death is at work in you, but life will be, work, be at work in them. Number two, <laughs> out of Philippians 3, it says, join with others in, them, in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who are living according to the pattern that we, we've given you. You've, you've given us that pattern to take hold of, and uh, I'll tell you much more before you leave, but uh, I love y'all. I love your family. Uh, Amen. Brother. I concur that uh, you've acted as a shepherd even before you were ordained as a shepherd. So I, 
I, I truly confirm that. And this is the, a word about Yeshua that I think applies to you all because you're being conformed to his image perfectly. The spirit of Yehovah shall rest upon you, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of, of knowledge and the spirit of the fear of Yehovah, and shall make you breathe in the fear of Yehovah, and, he shall not, and you shall not judge by the sight of your eyes, nor decide by the hearing of your ears. But with righteousness you shall judge for the poor, and shall decide with straightness for the meek ones of the land of Peru, and shall strike the land with the rod of your mouth, and slay the wrong with the breath of your lips. Amen. We love you. Amen. Well done. Although I'd like to take credit for this word, um, when I was explaining your testimony earlier in the van on the right up here uh, about how you were called to the high mountains, uh, Logan turned to this, and uh, I just wanted to say that it was an incredible thing. Um, it says, from the rocky peaks I see them, from the heights I view them, I see a people who live apart and do not consider themselves one of the nations. The Lord has given you an eye to see these people that have been set apart, that don't feel like they're part, but you are calling them to God's kingdom. And unlike Balaam, though, unlike Balaam, <laughs> you have been diligent in the matters. You gave yourself wholly to them uh, so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Amen. Amen. Come on, it's tight to get tight. Yeah. Amen. Um, buddy, Kim, Julia, I want to remind you of uh, two things that we're going to remind you, we'll be reminding you for the rest of your lives. Um, one was a word that he was gracious to give us while we were actually in the land. Isaiah 44, 3 through 5. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. One will say, I belong to the Lord. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Still another will write on his hand the Lord's and will take the name Israel. And the other word is uh, what our family shares, Isaiah 58, 12. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called a repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. We love you guys. Amen. Rob, when I think of popcorn, it reminds me of the kind of sparkle that comes off the back of your jeans. It's there for a moment and then gone. You know, it just uh, a bright flash. <laughs> Uh, so, so, buddy, you have loved me tremendously since, since I first got here. And if I remember correctly, you were the first person to rebuke me at this church. And you... <laughs> you, you started a cycle that forced me to grow up so that I can do the work. And, uh... And all I can say is, uh, I'm going to read in Ephesians 4, verse 15. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ, from the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does the, does the work. But he don't stop speaking the truth in love because it's saving lives. All right, let me get my place here. All right, check this out. Gloria a Dios. Gloria a Dios. Scoot back so you can be closer to her. Luke chapter one. Luke one five. In the time of Herod the king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all of the Lord's commands and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. One more scripture, and then this is the word. 1 John 2, 10. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him that makes him stumble. When I see you, I see Zechariah and Elizabeth, that even though you may well be advancing years, I tell you that when you go to Peru, you will lift up and you will raise up John the Baptist's. And they will be 
as, as, as of the same DNA that's in this house, and they will speak to the Herods that are oppressing the land, and there will be no turning back. And because you guys walk in love, because this is who you are, whoever loves his brother, you guys have loved us. Man, you will not stumble, brother. You will not stumble. So this is the word of the Lord to you guys. Amen. Amen. A minor point of clarification, if you're a guest here today, uh, be prepared to be offended. They will not raise up Baptist. That's not going to happen. They will raise up John the Immersers. Amen. Well, he, I don't know. He didn't say Egyptian popcorns. Popcorn sex in Egypt longer time. So I'm going to... It's hot in Egypt. It, has, it should pop fat. You people build pyramids. You can make popcorn. <laughs> No, I just want to say, encourage you guys with uh, 1 Timothy 3, and it says that he must manage his own family well and see that his children, his children obey him with proper respect. And that's one of the qualifications of being a pastor. And uh, living with you guys for a month and a half, you really reminded me a lot of the Vincents and how you manage your home and your household, not just in words, but in action and all of that. And I just want to encourage you that the more you do this, the more fruits are going to be happening everywhere you go. Just managing having that shalom in the house first, everything will come out of it. Love you, buddy. Amen. Hey, buddy. I don't have a word for you, but uh, I hope to be exchanging scriptures with you until we have a full set of gray hair. Uh, but I wanted to let you know that spending time with you has uh, changed the direction of my life. Uh, the Ludvigsons will always treasure our times with the Brazos, uh, with all you guys. And uh, we know that as you go out to Peru, you'll do the same for everybody else out there. Uh, so we know this calling is from the Lord, and uh, we stand with you always. Amen. Who said nothing good comes from Louisiana? <laughs> I beg to differ. We have three honorable men who lead this congregation and I look at your family God doesn't make mistakes I see three more beautiful people that have been impactful I believe we've known you probably the less but you've impacted our lives and at times where we were perplexed and disgusted you knew you had a God's eye and an ear and a heart to hear and know how to come to us so we appreciate all three of you and we love you amen Matt, he called us honorable. I mean, I understand that about Wade, but... Uh... All the courage, man. You got a new hairdo today. <laughs> Look at you. All the encouragement always goes out to you, but I want to say to you as a wife, Kim, keep your husband lifted before the Lord, and at night lay hands on him and pray for him. Trust me, it works. <laughs> hey, hey, I said that. Buddy Kim, would y'all come stand here for just a second? Congregation, would you stand to your feet? Yes. Father, we thank you for the Brasso family. Lord, they are our family. We lift up the ministry, Ichad to Peru. And we say, may it be so, Lord. May it be so. Lord, let your spirit guide them. Let your word fill them. Mighty one, may they break down the strongholds of the enemy and make it a dwelling place for your great name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, if y'all will get ready for a benedictory prayer, I'm just kidding, sit down. <laughs> You're about to get a whole bag of popcorn.
In all honesty, this is why we formed this ministry. Is we wanted to see ministries grow up and go out. That was our goal. So I have just a few minutes here. I mean, who are we kidding? I have all the time that I want to take. <laughs> but I want to take just a few minutes to share something so that this is not just ceremony. Those of you that have experienced this with us know that it's more than that. But some of you are experiencing us for the first time. Others of you could get lost in the ceremony of the event. I want to talk to you about the phrase, come and go. For some, the phrase, come and go, indicates a lack of commitment. You've heard it said, come and go as you like. You might have heard the saying, easy come, easy go. To many, the phrase, come and go, is said lightly and means almost nothing except that you're not that committed. In the one association, it indicates the exact opposite. It's a sacred statement. It attests to the highest and the holiest of all callings. In the remaining time that we have, I want to explore the meaning of come and go with you. I think that we can do it in two scriptures. Proving the dispensational thought of cessationist wrong. You're about to see a miracle today. <laughs> Turn with me to the book of Matthew. Find the fourth chapter. When you've discovered the fourth chapter, if you have one of those Bibles that highlights Jesus' words in red, what you're going to find out, yeah, Angel, do you have one of those Bibles, girl? What you're going to find out is that after the baptism of Jesus and after the temptation of Jesus, the first red words in the Gospel of Matthew are in verse 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. These words have been used and overused to the point that we've experienced a semantic drift. To us, repent has come to mean something along the lines of feel bad and hope for heaven. Repent actually means to hit a brick wall and make a U-turn. To come to a place where you say, I can no longer go in this direction. I've got to turn around. I've got to pick a new direction. The first thing that Jesus had to say was repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. When you begin to feel the kingdom of heaven and you compare that with how you are living on a regular basis, you hit a brick wall. I can't go in that direction anymore. I can't live like that anymore. I have found something that is worth turning towards. During worship today, I felt the kingdom of heaven. And I pray that you did too. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into a lake for they were fishermen. I appreciated Pastor Miller's word. Look at the next red words in your Bible. Come, follow me. Jesus said, the call of the gospel was to come and follow Jesus, not believe Jesus. You were raised to believe for a time period in your life that there was a Santa Claus. You believed it, but you didn't put on a red suit and go to every house in the world and leave gifts. What you believe doesn't matter at all. The demons in hell believe that there is one God and they shudder at his name. The call of the gospel is not to believe. The call of the gospel is clearly come follow. What you're seeing here today is that when Buddy took that car ride with Pastor Mike, 
He didn't just become a believer. What started as belief turned into a relentless pursuit. He came to follow Jesus. Now, we're all friends, at least up to this point. But many of you in this room are in fact believers. Oh, I believe in Jesus. Oh, I believe Jesus was raised from the dead. But you're a long ways from being a follower of Jesus. You're happy to say, I believe in Jesus. But that gets you nothing more than it's got the demon. Belief alone is dead. But when that belief is coupled with the action of following Jesus, it is life. Yeah, that is worth clapping for. Let me be honest. The reason some of you are not clapping is because it didn't make you happy. It hurt you. And that's okay. Sometimes you go to the doctor for him to tell you it's a well visit. But most of the time, you go to the doctor to find out what's wrong with you. If you're sitting in here now when your life is not a blazing testimony for Jesus Christ, I am telling you what is wrong with you. If you didn't want that, you shouldn't have walked into this house. You endangered your sinful nature when you donned the doors. There are plenty of circuses that will entertain you every Sunday. This is not one of them. Come, follow me. Some of you are sitting here saying, well, I believe and I've begun to follow. You can see that I'm following because I've, I've started coming to church. But see, Jesus said, come follow me and, somebody say and. and. I will make you, I will make you, I will make you fishers of men. Some of you have passed the test of belief in this house. I believe, but you have not followed. Others have said, I believe, and I've begun to follow. But how many of you can say, I've been catching men for Jesus? How far do we fall short of the gospel? The first words that Jesus spoke to people were, come, follow me. And it was for a purpose. The purpose was that you would become like Jesus. Oh, let that sit on your soul for a minute. See, I got you for a few more minutes. Unless you're brave enough to get up and walk out while I'm speaking, in which case I will still have you till you reach the door. I want to confront your condition today. Because I live with the awesome feeling that I may stand before the living God. And you have stood next to me. And we enjoyed a service together. And we praised his name together. But he looks at you and says, depart from me. I never knew you. So no, 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 no. I say, Lord, Lord. He says, yes, but I never knew knew you so pass the test do you believe oh yes yes i believe are you following eh, uh. if you are believing and following do you know what will be accompanying your life you will be a fisher of men your life will be like jesus so let me ask you how many disciples are following you around wanting to be like you are because you have become like Jesus. Anybody have the courage to stand up and tell me this, this does not apply to you? We can have a public discussion. Can I tell you I know it applies to you? I know that it does. And I intend, because God has called me as he has called Buddy, to see what has happened in Buddy's life happen in every life in here because the call of the gospel was not a call to believe on Jesus help in this life and heaven in the next the call of the gospel was not fire insurance so that it was not hot for you in hell 
The call of the gospel was that you would have a train wreck in your life. Leave the damnation of your worthless life behind and chase after the only thing that matters. And as you do, it creates such a movement that others want to follow you to. I've watched that happen in Richard's life too. I've watched it. We must be more than believers. We must be more than followers. But I know by the Spirit of God, many of you have failed that test before we even get to the third. When you plant a seed, when the seed has really been planted, there should be a return of 30, 60, and 100 fold. A return. If you plant a seed and nothing happens, then something's wrong with the soil or something's wrong with the seed. If you claim to be in Christ, but you are not following him, the only conclusion you can come to is something is wrong with Christ or something is wrong with you. You're going to have to repent. The kingdom is near you, but that does not make you in the kingdom. Secondly, if that seed is planted and it has begun to grow, then it produces after its kind. You want to know what you are? Look around and see what you're producing. I love this church. We are family. I've watched God take ordinary men and do extraordinary things. The call of the gospel is come and go. When you come to Jesus, you don't come to belief alone. You don't come to following alone. You don't come to fruit alone. Do you know what the belief, the following, and the fruit actually do? They create a way of life. See, Buddy moved from the state he was in, from the job that he was in. He left everything behind to come and learn a way of life. Christianity has fallen so far that some look at us and say, that sounds like a cult. That's because you've never met Christ. When you leave everything, follow Jesus, and begin to be made into what he's called you to be. Well, now we're talking about being in the kingdom. The idea that Matthew doesn't have to leave his tax collector's booth, that Peter doesn't have to leave his nets, that Abraham doesn't have to leave Babylon, this is a lie. And if you believe you can enter the kingdom of God without leaving your life behind, you have been lied to. And they will not be there to help you with the separation of the righteous and the wicked. We do not intend to lie to you. We want to help you. In Hebrew, we're not going to turn to it because we're going to do two scriptures. In Hebrews, you're commanded to examine your leader's way of life, considering the outcome. You're not commanded to examine their doctrinal statement. You're not commanded to believe what they believe. You have to know their way of life because that's what you are joining to make you what they are. That's discipleship. When Paul wanted to remind the Corinthian church of his way of life, which he said agreed with what he taught in every church, he sent them his son, Timothy. This would be very much like sending Michael or sending Buddy or sending another man of God to a church to remind them of the way of life. See, Jesus could send these men who followed him anywhere in the world, and they were an example of what the kingdom is, not what to believe. They had followed, they had found, they had produced, they were the kingdom. We want that to be a special select group called the clergy, but the truth is, it's Christian. And you are not a Christian if you believe only. You are not a Christian if you claim to follow, but you have not become like. You hear that? If you're taking me seriously right now, some of you should be terrified. 
What a thing it is to fall into the hands of God. As soon as you have heard the word come, follow me, and I will make you into something. The process of discipleship begins. As Pastor Miller said, you may have cast the net on this side of the boat and that and never caught anything. But when you cast where he says and when he says you begin to reap a harvest, you have to learn the way of life. You can't download it from the internet. You can't experience it through a TV set. The kingdom is transferred from one life to one life. Our second scripture for the day. Let's go to Matthew 28. Therefore... Go. See, the kingdom is about come and go. You have to come to him to be discipled. You have to come to him to be transformed. You have to come to him to be immersed in a way of life that you can then go with. But he has come, learned a way of life, produced fruit, developed into maturity, and now buddy must go. For us, come and go is not easy. For us, come and go is not lack of commitment. Come and go is because of commitment. For us, come and go is not an axiom that we believe. It is a life that we have embraced, and it is the only way into the kingdom. Therefore, go. Somebody say, go. Go. And make. See, you were not saved so that you could be saved. You did not believe so that you could just believe. Believing was so that you could follow. Following was so that you could be made into something. And once you had believed and been transformed, God would send you to go and make. Say, go Go. and make. make. See, The first red letters after the temptation of Jesus are come and follow because I will make you into something. The last red letters in the book of Matthew are you go and make something. If you do not fit into the first red letters, you certainly do not fit into the last red letters. You know, the Bible tells churches to examine themselves and see if they're in the faith. Churches, congregations. Therefore, go make disciples. A disciple is one who is being taught, disciplined, corrected, rebuked, trained in righteousness for the purpose of becoming like the one discipling them. So let me ask you. Let me ask everybody on this side of the room, everybody in the middle, everybody in the back corner. When were you discipled? Who discipled you? When did you leave things because of a belief in Jesus, followed him, and were trained in a way that transformed your life so that you could go then and make more Christians? My God, is he talking to me? Yes, I am speaking to you. If you are not making more Christians, it might be because you were never discipled. And if you were never discipled, it might be that you never actually followed Jesus. You just believed like a young child believes in Santa Claus. This is the gospel of Matthew. It's not an esoteric text. It's not hidden somewhere. This is basic, bare-knuckle gospel. So, well, I know that I'm saved. How do you know that you were saved? How does a lemon tree know it's a lemon tree? How do you know that you were saved? Well, I prayed a prayer. Well, that's good. That's good. I also ate a hamburger. More than one, actually. Well, I was baptized. I was confirmed. You show me in your Bibles 
where one man has the right to declare another man saved. Show me that. You know how you know you're saved? When you hit a brick wall, you turn to Jesus, and he turned you into something altogether new. Church, my heart's desire is that not a person would leave this room without, at the very least, having a collision with that brick wall. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations. This is not an ethnic issue. It is not a racial issue. It is not a nationalistic issue. All men everywhere, the process is the same. No theologian has the right to change it. No denomination has the right to change it. Not even a man in a funny hat speaking ex cathedra has a right to change what the Son of God said. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Can you imagine trying to translate the phrase, Charlie Brown's got a green thumb? Well, how would you do that? Now, some of us from the South would go, Charlie can grow anything. That's not quite what we said, but that's what we meant. For a Jew to say baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you need to understand something. That is not a magical formula like hocus pocus. That is not open sesame. It is not a special linguistic phrase that unlocks anything. It is a Jewish idiom or expression that means something very specific. You must be immersed in, enveloped in, covered in all that is the Father. See, the name of the Father is his character, his authority, and his reputation. You must be baptized into all that is the Son. Totally immersed in everything that is the Son. Totally immersed in and over your head in all that is the Spirit. Getting wet and having someone say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit over you simply takes a dry sinner and makes him a wet sinner that is now confused. But when you have been immersed into the character of the Father, the character of the Son, the character of the Holy Ghost, when your whole life has changed for the glory of God... When you come to him, he makes you like him. And if you're not like him, you better come again. We used to say that in Louisiana. Somebody would say, hey man, you said come again. What did you say to me? Come again. Well, yeah, I'm saying to you, you better come again. I'm not sure the first time took. Because I don't see 30, 60, and 100 fold. Because I see many of you that are believers... You think and talk about being followers, but you haven't been made into fishers of men. The purpose of belief was to follow. The purpose of following was to be transformed. And once that had happened, God himself would commission you to go and do this for other people. Go make disciples. Immerse them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And get verse 20. Please, if you, if you have anything except a black highlighter, use it now. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. I am so sick of hearing people say, well, all you really have to do is... It's a very minimalist form of salvation, and I don't think it's salvation at all. You may have been told all you have to do is what gives them the right. The last words that Jesus said to his disciples are teach them to obey everything I commanded to you. I promised you two scriptures. So we're going to stop there. But let me ask you in a very personal way. Are you obeying everything that he told you to do or some things that he told you to do? Have you solaced yourself with the idea that you believe Jesus? 
I hope I've distanced you from that comforting thought. Are you following Jesus? Does it show up in your life? Would your friends and co-workers say, that guy is definitely a follower of Jesus? Can you look and point to the dramatic change in character that has caused people to say, it's like he was dead and now he's alive. Can you say, my own children know of my burning passion for God? Because if you can't, you are in danger sitting in the safest place on earth. And it's not the danger that motivates me. The truth is, is I just think he's actually worth doing what he says. I was sick to death of being around people who said they were Christians and didn't do anything that he said. Do you despise hypocrites in church? Are you a hypocrite in church right now? Oh, the problem, the problem, pastors, those churches do this and those Christians do this. Yeah, what are you doing? A scripture that we will not turn to. In the second chapter of James, in the 18th verse, says, I will show you my faith by what I do. Would you stand to your feet?